Uh, Bonnie Dyer, can you tell me your name and where you live, please? Yes, I'm Marjorie Budd and I live in Kumastwith. And can I start by asking how long you've lived in this part of the Cambry Mountains? It's nearly 45 years, actually. And, and, and what brought you here? We loved Wales. We'd visited before. And then the opportunity came to move and we thought, let's look in Wales. And we looked around several places. No, nope, no, nope, couldn't find them for a start. <laughs> and then my husband found in the back of the car an old Dalton's Weekly a magazine that had adverts of many sorts in. And he said, what do you think of this? And he read out this little advertisement and it said, delightful rural setting, close Aberystwyth, village post office, general stores, petrol pumps. And we looked at one another. And we thought, there's the answer. Somewhere to live and living for us both. And we're both there, children go to school and, ah, let's have a look, you know. And we haven't been able to find the other places, but we looked every village all the way to Aberystwyth in case that was it. And when we got to the seafront, couldn't go any further. (laughs) Then there was a phone box, so we rang up and it was in Croydon. And of course they, they spoke, I had to spell out the name of the village and I had, and then they spelt back the name of the telephone exchange <laughs> and then they said oh but we, we, you've got to give us your name and address otherwise you might not this might not suit you but we've got others there we are now for once in my life my navigation was perfect and I came straight here you see and, and we, we drove past slowly oh that must be it Oh, look at that. Yes. Let's go along and we'll see the rest of the village, we thought. Well, the time we got a few miles along the road, we realised that was it. (laughs) So we stopped. Well, that was it. They said it is. Yes. Well, we'll turn round then, go back and have another look. And that's what we did. And then phone box down the road, so rang up, probably put four pennies in. Oh, no, it was beyond that then. But anyway, had enough coinage. And this very surprised gentleman said, yes, I could come and have a look. Where are you? Just down the road. And he chuckled, which was so nice. (laughs) And up we came. And, do you know, we walked in and there was the smell of bacon, uh, wellingtons, fruit and veg. Oh, it was lovely. And we waited while he served somebody. And then he, he, we had a general chat and we said, we're not really interested, but do you mind if we do have a look? Yes. Well, he showed us around and it was home. And we couldn't wait to get here. And from that moment it was home and we, we loved it ever since. So, so that's it in a nutshell. So you moved f- from? From Reading, actually. From yes, Reading. The big estate in Reading, yes. Big estate in Reading to... Uh, a nearly nothing estate <laughs> in, in the Cameron Mountains in Cumberstwith. Yes, yes. What were your first impressions of, of, of discovering this part of Wales to start with? We couldn't believe how beautiful it, it was and still is. Very little changed. Uh, we just, look at that, kept saying, look at that, as we drove past. And, do you know, the thrill of seeing it all hasn't changed I still love it, just like that first visit, and my husband was the same. It was just home. Uh, and you, you took over the post office here in Cumberstwith? Yes, that's right. Uh, in, in the year 1978, 19... December the 1st, we moved in, and it was a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> to, to tell me about those first few weeks of settling in <laughs> midwinter, yes, you well, said it was a blizzard. Yes, it, we arrived in a blizzard, and... Um, oh, we, we we drove in convoy, me and my little three-wheeler with a trailer, and my husband with the estate with a big trailer, and I didn't know the way, hopeless I am, uh, but I, I was determined not to lose sight of his tail lights. you see, I just couldn't, could I? And, <laughs> and I'd got a leak in the petrol tank, <laughs> so I was scared of running out of fuel, but, and then as we were coming along the M4, the snow was coming towards us. Oh my word, that was a journey and a half. And uh, as we got over the border into Wales, 
fortunately my husband pulled in to give me a hug and say welcome to Wales you see and then I said well that's lovely but I'm nearly out of petrol <laughs> so we we had to um, fill up and and then I said look you've got to drive slowly because by now the, the the snow was thick and fast well coming all the way through the Brecon Beatons it was it was quite exciting I remember with one skid with the trailer and my little girl was five and she was asleep on the passenger seat and there was absolutely no room inside either of our cars for another box of matches I don't think it was so crammed anyway after the last snow drift I managed to get through I thought that I can't get through another one like that if it's any worse I'm stuck but it was the worst and after that it was better and then coming down from Devil's Bridge to climb up and then as we came round the corner we could see the light, the street lamp. Oh, what a beacon that was. And it was just wonderful. We'd got here and we were allowed to stay in the little cottage next door, which was wonderful, till we could take over. And we'd come prepared with a pressure cooker full of stew and some helpers were coming with us and they got here soon after us and we all piled into this little cottage and I don't know where on earth we slept but we managed it and then the next day we were bringing things in uh, the, uh, while they finished the shop and then it was stock taking and then we meantime the um, removal van managed to find it and oh that was a relief to see him arrive so we were carrying bits in all day and well, there we were, we were too busy. And, and you know, um, it, was, it was really cold, but we thought, well, it's the, it's the Welsh mountains, we just get used to it, that's all. <laughs> we didn't realise it was the worst winter for 16 years. <laughs> that wasn't a disappointment, mind. We were quite relieved. <laughs> but you you was... couldn't have chosen, probably, uh, a more extreme, challenging house move no. than this one. No, we couldn't especially as uh, uh, the day before when we were waiting for the removal van to arrive it didn't and the two men who'd given up a weekend to help us they happened to be traffic policemen and it turned out <laughs> turned out that the removal van hadn't got a tax disc oh my word so I mean they very nearly didn't come at all but anyway it all got sorted we were, we were, we were fine and it was all legally um, seen to shall we say but perhaps I shouldn't say that <laughs> you, you, you came here with your husband yes your husband's name he was Reg Fred so Marjorie and Reg arrive in the Cambria Mountains yes 1978 we December did. yes with who else there was my son Nigel who was seven and my daughter Hilary, who was five. So how did you settle in, the, the four of you? The four of us, well, it was just like ducks to water. Apart from Hilary, she was a little social butterfly on our estate. I never knew where to find her, actually. Uh, and so she felt a little bit restricted to start with, but not for long. And then she started to realise she could talk to people in the shop. And people were so sweet with her and welcoming to us all really do you know after three weeks we we said to one another we know far more people now than we did for 11 years where we used to live and it was somewhat wonderful and people were genuinely friendly nice and helpful it was terrific and it's still the same and your son your son's name again Nigel Nigel mm. how did he settle in he was he was a very quiet child, a nervous child. And actually, Devil's Bridge School, Minnoch it is, saved him, I'm sure, because he was lost in the 600 in the last primary school. 600 to 28, I think it was. It was wonderful for him. He gradually grew in confidence. They picked up Welsh without realising it. Within six months, they were both absolutely fluent. And um, he had individual attention. And it was the best thing that could have happened to him. And 
and my daughter was f absolutely fine. It was a love. It is still a delightful school, and I can't express enough thanks for them for what they did for my children. Mm. And similarly, they went to Tregaron School, not a huge school, but it was just right for them, and they both flourished. I'm very, very grateful to the system for it. Mm. So how do they? You're, you're here in Cumberswick. We're not far from Devil's Bridge. No, no. How do they get to to the school every day? Oh, there was a Land Rover. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It was yes, wonderful, Ooh. and. It was, the Land Rover then? <laughs> there was oh this was all very official and organized you know <laughs> as it still is uh, there was a, a gentleman who lived in um, Pontridge Groyce who had it um, part of his business was school transport and so the Land Rover was appropriate you see for up here as it was proved well one morning we, we opened the curtains really the extra thick snow more and we thought well nobody's going to school today so we didn't and then half past eight sharp there was the Land Rover and well we, I was ready for the shop but the children were just in the pajamas so <laughs> we didn't expect that so well there we are we didn't get caught out again I think it says a lot about Land Rovers at the it, uh, yeah <laughs> that, and the driver they, they, yes and the, <laughs> do, you and, remember, do you remember who the driver was yes I do David Lord Jones is a well-known family they were in in Pontry de Grois and, and can you tell me something about D David oh what do you remember of him uh, oh a charming man very very good with the children um he, his his widow still lives in Pontry de Grois and he's the family had been there for many years with transport business mm -hmm. and um he he handled the children beautifully very friendly and they they be all behaved well. They would. These rural children are lovely. They are. Uh, how many would he pick up? Uh, oh my word! Nigel um, and Hillary, 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 Hillary. Yes, yeah. um, there were two who lived along the road. Oh, there must have been five or six, I think. Yeah, and there was the ministry farm that was then. There were some children there, so there weren't any spare spaces really. Mm. Them. Well, nowadays it had to be a bit more regulated perhaps because it's you know seat belts and all but in those days they weren't overcrowded and I think they probably like the little seats in the back <laughs> yes. you mentioned the ministry farm there yes Can you tell me something more about the ministry farm yes it was, Where was that oh it um in between here and Devil's Bridge there's um we used to call it the ministry farm the ministry of agriculture fisheries and food it was um, established to find the best way of animal husbandry and different crops that grew around here. So it was all very scientific, of course. And they used to um, carefully uh, weigh lambs as they were born and mark their progress. And the, the sheep had little number plates around their necks. <laughs> so they identify them. Um, so it, it was quite fascinating and we were allowed to go very kindly by the manager there to watch lambing the first year because it was all new to us and so he said come around to the sheds about 10 o'clock that's when they get lambs seem to be born quite a lot so we'd go there and, and watch the lambing and it, it was a real education um it's, it's it was part of the culture that we wanted to in, embrace and it was lovely to be allowed with genuine yes come and have a look and we were made so welcome in every aspect really mm. a, a big responsibility to take over the a rural post office and and the shop as well yes 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 tell us about the shop life here uh, in commerce with for you as a family and and maybe some of the, um, the characters and the, the customers you had. <laughs> yes, when we first came, there were s several ladies and gentlemen who'd been born in the village or nearby, and so they'd, they, this had been their life in Comustrith, on the farms or working in the farm uh, um, in various capacities. Um, and so they were fountains of knowledge and um, they used to use the shop because that's what they all did, traditionally. 
um, and so and we had time to chat and they did and we we loved it and actually we used to make cups of tea polystyrene cups and we'd all have a cup of tea and chat it was quiet so, uh, so it was very sociable and and after a while there were sort of interestingly Saturday mornings became a nice gathering point for the local people uh, who wanted and they'd come in and we'd all be having cups of tea from the polystyrene and it was a wonderful social event and it was in Welsh lovely um, and they said oh sorry no no we want you to how are we going to learn otherwise I'm afraid it didn't work for me or Edge but we wanted <laughs> to <laughs> Oh, do you to be back? Oh, do you want to be back? 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 Do you want to over halfway there, if, you, if you've got the accent. <laughs> ah, well, it was only last night that a friend of mine sitting here, who's, who is English, but whose Welsh is wonderful. He's a good linguist. Um, he's, I mean, I was complaining that, you know, I just can't remember things. And he said, that's because I haven't taught you. So we'll see what happens now. And did, did Reg um, learn some Welsh? No, he, he was a, a bit like me wanting to but somehow other things you've just got to do this got to do this got to do this it's the time and concentration and we we haven't got a linguistic ability sadly but we we were desperate to learn actually and I still would love to my last stint was three lessons three years down at fairly recently in Aberystwyth I got a bit further but it doesn't stick uh, it's not back back to the shop what was it like running this shop now it was um it's hard work it was um early in the morning till late at night and there's it, it's a matter of standing there and listening very often which is interesting but um so in some ways you're a bit of a social worker um if you know what i mean having a listening ear and we all need that uh and it, it was i loved it um uh, but then the the stock control and the filling of the shelves and maybe making some orders um, and then the housework and cooking and cleaning for the family it, it sort of all had to be woven into the day somehow how many days a week were you open um mostly seven um because um well there was a need for for us as a, a family concern but also um, on the, in the summer, the, the holiday makers coming by, needing petrol and um, ice creams, and we we used to do some home baking too, um, and so we needed to survive to to get the trade because as lovely as folks are around here, there's not many, and um, so we we knew that when we came. So not just a shop, but and a post office, but a, a petrol station. Yes. Yeah. I find that when, when you when you drive into Kamaswith from whichever direction you come from, yeah. you think to yourself, "Well, gosh, there isn't much here," but you get the feel that there was quite a bit, a lot here at one point. Tell tell me about running the petrol element of of the service here. <laughs> any, well, when we came, any stories? <laughs> yes, our <laughs> our gentleman, the, the gentleman we took over from, said. Do you know you can trust the local people absolutely they'll serve themselves and they'll come in and tell you how much they've had you see and we had a system of cards where people signed uh, how much they'd had or goods and so it was a, a monthly account really and so it was easier all round uh, and then the ministry farm had theirs and um, and that was quite complex to work out but uh, at the end I I just handed the card to a man in the office over there and he did all the working out for me because he was much better at it than me. And um, <laughs> I swapped him for an apple pie every month. <laughs> That's a good it saved, deal. saved me <laughs> hours. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and then, so where, where did the fuel come from? Oh, it came all the way from St Clair's. When we first came, it was Shell. And no, it wasn't, it was Esso. What am I saying? I'm advertising in the wrong direction, aren't I? It was Esso. But after the first summer, there was this gentleman standing in the uh, shop and he was looking a bit serious. Oh, can I help you? Um, well, I don't know really, he said, and he introduced himself as being as a representative from Esso. And he said, we are closing, we're not no longer supplying um, small petrol stations. You're closing us down. Well, uh, not exactly. I said, how can we survive if you're not going to supply us with petrol? Oh gosh, that was an awful moment. And he said, well, um, there is a petrol supplier who's willing to come and supply petrol. He said, it's, it's called Becker Petrol. And they're from Carmarthenshire, St. Clair's. And the rep can come and see you if that's what you'd like. So that's what happened. So we had a, a change of petrol supplier and a new post. The yeah, SO came down after many years and up went the Becker. Mind you, it wasn't all good news, that Becker pump. The, the pump, the petrol was fine. But <laughs> the post, I noticed the a farm dog uh, cock his leg and squeal and run off. And it happened several times and I told my husband, he said, I said, look, every time he shep cocks his leg against there, he squeals and runs off. Well, he found out that it was live, didn't he? And, <laughs> yes, the, 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 some gadget at the top of the post, the very top, or long way up, that had, um, there'd been a slight fault had it been screwed in and it had worn into a wire and it wasn't insulated enough so it could have been very nasty for anybody actually <laughs> <laughs> but we were all safe after a little bit of adjustment and how long did you continue selling fuel for uh, 12 years and then sadly um, what with the demise of the caravan club they used uh, in the area it used to be so packed with caravans but with the um, takeoff of literal takeoff of foreign holidays, um, there was so much less home trade, and that was significant. And similarly, uh, less tourists, foreign tourists, and so eventually it, it dwindled. And then the growth of supermarkets, of course. Um, it wasn't just us; most we would hear from our suppliers, oh, everybody's lost about 30%. And actually, it's not sustainable after that. So very, very, very sadly, because we loved it. Mm. It was the social aspect more than anything we really loved. Um, we had to close the doors. And, do you know, it was two years before I could go into a small shop. Couldn't do it. So we the petrol, felt the petrol station and the shop. Yes, we had to, and the post office. It, it all had to close. We we just could not sustain it as a going concern. Sadly, mm. it was awful. So, but you must have you must have had some good times in the shop. Oh, every day. Yes, yes, yes. I think the only day we didn't have a good time really was the day when there was an awful, awful blizzard, and we, I think, takings were seven pound fifty. Um, and then it was terrible. Um, you know, there was snow in the roof. There was we didn't know about snow getting into roofs. Then we soon found out. Um, it was everybody was badly affected. The whole country. But that that was the worst. It was quite worrying. Do you remember which year that was? Oh gosh, was it eighty two? Mm, Something yeah, like that. Right, yeah. um, I'm not best for years. I think it was eighty two. Mm. Yeah, because when people were out and about again uh, oh we've we've just cleared the snow out of our attic what do you mean snow in your attic well it comes in under the slates does it oh yeah you better have a look well you know better then you see so up he went with a ladder and there was just a small opening into the the, the um the loft pushed it to one side, 
got a torch, head, shoulders and torch up. Oh my word, it looked like an Arctic scene up there. You know, lots of boxes and stuff that are there. You wouldn't have been surprised at penguins sliding around. It was covered with snow. So, oh my word. So, um, if this lot drips through, we'll be in a right old mess. So, that night, he, he, my husband got a big saw and he made a big hole. And then he, he was climbing up, up the ladder, a uh, load of black sacks and dustpan and brush. And he was sweeping up. And then my son was walking across the joist, dragging the sack of, or half a sack of snow. Then I was carrying it down the stair, the ladder. And my daughter was dragging it, bumping it down the stairs and tipping it out the front. And we were, we did this for two evenings, you know. And <laughs> there was a big, big circle of, of snow heaps all the way around the front. Well, it didn't matter because no cars were going to get there to, to fill up with petrol or anything. And, um, and then where we couldn't get to, was fortunately over the back and we put lots of old towels and bedspreads and that down and it took two days to drip through but it didn't do any harm fortunately but that been, was the worst <laughs> it must be very cold here how it was you, a bit chilly how did you stay warm as a family well when it was extreme like that mm. we kept this fire going with with coal and we slept in this room yeah um because it was it was we were a bit worried really and and the, we had a couple of puppies then as well and so we all heaped in together here mm -hmm. you know um mattresses on the floor and we sort of wake up in the night and put a bit more coal on but that's the way we survived yeah. and um not for long really uh he soon he soon blocked up and put got a, a bigger trap door and um a proper ladder and it's still there in the good times in the shop, mm. what were the best sellers? What what was popular? Uh, well, um, home baking actually was very popular. And we used to love doing it. We used to make rolls. Do you know, um, Ronnie Corbett, the um, c comedian, my husband was watching him on a programme on telly, um, Ronnie at home or something, and he told him, oh, I make my bread. And he demonstrated, Ronnie did, and he said, oh, I only mix it once. And that made gave my husband an idea. Oh, he don't need to let it rise twice and all this. No, 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 he said, just once. And that's what he, we did. So we started making small loaves and lots of rolls and then pastry. And, um, and it sort of took off, so we did quite a lot of home baking for a few years. I can show you a photograph mm -hmm. later on. Yeah, yeah. But I must tell you though, <laughs> if you've got a minute, <laughs> uh, how I started making Welsh cakes. It was quite funny. Uh, we'd we'd taken a consignment of um, aluminium. They were griddles. We thought that's a nice traditional thing to sell. Not aluminium. They'd have been iron, but this was the second best. It's all we could get. And uh, they'd come in, so we got a pile of about half a dozen aluminium griddles, and, and um, we'd we'd had a few. Uh, we'd been to a a trade fair, and so we s selected a few gifts and that to put around. And uh, um, anyway, this lady and gentleman came in. It was a, a French student. He told me from uh, Aberystwyth, and his wife, uh, his mother, sorry, his mother, and she was coming to visit him, and he. He wanted to show her the area and he said um, I would love her to try s some traditional Welsh cakes only he said I could only like buy shop you know bulk bulk ones he said where could I get any well me being me and not wise always thought oh I can make you some you see could you how long did it take Oh, I said it, it would oh, probably take at least half an hour. Mm, oh dear, dear, dear. That was me. Mm. Anyway, oh, I said, I'll make you a cup of tea. You can, nice day, sit out on the terrace and look at the view and I'll do it. Well, you see, that's what happened. And so my husband was busy cleaning one of these aluminium uh, uh, griddles. And I said, you've got to put margarine or oil on them and start tempering them a bit do that and that was on the electric cooker 
try it. In the meantime, we were looking through recipe books that we were selling for finding the Welsh cake recipe. Oh, blow me, we couldn't find one. And then I suddenly thought, oh, there's that apron in the window. Gorgeous PVC apron with Welsh recipes on. So I leaned into the window and I sort of blew the dead flies off. And there was there was there was the Welsh cake recipe. So I got that spread out in the kitchen and making the making the recipe, you see, meantime, they were coming in. Are they ready yet? No, not quite, not quite, she said, still rolling them out. And well, my first attempt was a bit of a disgrace really. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to the Welsh culture. My first attempt didn't do it any favours. They were a bit sticky and they took and we hadn't really got the temperature right. So the first ones that came off were a bit soggy in the middle. But uh so we tried again a little bit higher and a little bit more flour. And uh so that's what I offered up to this French couple. But um well parent parent and son you could have um, but international relations then, I could have well. done. Entente cordiale wiped out forever. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, we've Im we improved. And then um, it, it became quite a thing. I used to love doing them. I still love flipping them over, you know. And uh, so, so, so that's how we started with our home baking, really. Uh, made a good few since. And I still do. T tell me about the, the different roles that you and Reg had in the shop. Who did what? Well, Reg was best at arranging fruit and veg. When, there was an, an, a, a display system when we came that we couldn't better. It was the old wooden tomato crates set at 45 degrees, a row of those, well, three, two rows of those, and, and then bins underneath them. So you had put carrots in one, sweet in another, in the bins at the bottom, and then perhaps bananas, tomatoes, all the different things, lettuce and things, arranged in as they went up, and and then we'd have a or oh, the box of mushrooms <laughs> by the scales <laughs> on the on the counter. Well, he was very good at arranging things. It looked more like a harvest festival time he'd done it, uh, but I, I wasn't. Um, but and he did stock control much better than me, and um, and also he was much better at going round the cash and carry. Oh my goodness, we had a little Renault 5 for a while and he would load up a big trolley, a very big trolley you get in cash and carries. That's, um, well, they, there's, you'd see them on railway stations probably, something like that. And I've, the staff would come out sometimes, or one of them or two of them, to watch him get all this lot in the Renault 5. It was incredible. It, it, it even got down to him undoing a box of biscuits and tucking the individual packs in all the way round to make sure that nothing was left on the trolley. He never got beaten, you know. And then when when he got back, we'd, we'd have the joy of extricating it all, keeping it all in pristine condition and and then pricing them up. That was the nightmare. Nowadays, of course, it's scanned. Mm -hmm. But in those days, you had to get a little clicky gadget and a roll of labels in, and every bit had to be priced individually. Oh, my God. Goodness, we used to get repetitive strain injury, probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it that's what we did. And I've still got a couple of items with our little tickets on them still, you know. With, the, with, your, with a name on the ticket? Yes, Post Office Comostry. Well, well. Yeah, tiny writing, but there they are. I've got a packet of chickpeas, and actually, there was a lip balm, and I found one of those. Well, look, it's over, well over 20 years old, but it still works. <laughs> what was your role then? Oh, well, chief cook and bottle no, washer. There no role for you in the Renault fight, was there? Ah! Uh, <laughs> what was your... What was your well, I was uh, stocking the shelves behind the counter, post office serving petrol, um, actually um, anything else we, we both did but then when things were fairly quiet which there were quite a few months where they were we have to say 
um, read your gut and do odd jobs. And, and so that helped. And he also got a job after a few years at Hendrick Quarry at Chester Admiry. And he would be over there um, like cleaning around the offices whenever we would go home, but also cooking the, the blocks. Not books, blocks. <laughs> and he, um, he, it was a matter, I think, of checking the temperature on the, the ovens. And then when they got to temperature, you could switch them down and so on. And, and then, of course, if it was really, really cold, it would all take longer. Mm. But he'd start about four and come home sometimes about 10 o'clock at night if it was really cold. Uh, but it all helped, you mm, see. Yeah, yeah. How profitable was running a post office shop, petrol station in Cumberstwith back, back then? Uh, oh, well, I have to say, what with, um, when we came, interest rates got up to 20%, which was phenomenal. But we, we, we just thought, oh, well, a couple of years, we our belts tied a bit, you know, tightened, and not spending anything extra. We'll pay off a little bit of loan we had to have, um, and we'll be plain sailing. But actually, as it turned out, we needed to do quite a bit of maintenance, and um, which my husband was good at. He, he sort of, he liked getting stuck into the building. Shop work wasn't his real forte, to be honest. Um, he, he enjoyed talking to people and meeting people, but. After a while, he got itchy hands. He wanted to get out and be doing more practical stuff, um, and so he was kept really busy. But it all took a lot of money, as it does now, um, and so I'm afraid it was not not we we were told we're not going to get rich here, which we didn't expect to or want to. Um, but we um, we did spend a bit too much on the fabric of the building, we could say, but it was essential. But there we are. We, we loved it so much that it's a, it's a it was part of living yeah, here. Yeah, it's a lovely building here yes. on the main road, if I can call it a main road. It's the main <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> it's the main mountain road here. Yes, yes. Between um, Kuma Swith, of course, Devil's Bridge and... And the Elam Valley and yes, Hyadal. Yes. And it, it is a magnificent building. It's, it's, you, know, you can be fooled when you drive past thinking, oh, ordinary building. But I, you know, we're, we're here inside. You've got the crackling fire over there. We've got the, uh, the, 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 the slate slabbed floor yes. and a yeah. lovely little I love staircase. It. And the height of the ceilings. And it's, um, well, we were just, we just fell in love with the place. It was, it was like wrapped itself round us and it was home. And um, we've had to work a lot in every single room. You know, you stripped off all the panelling and uh, and in the hall, the panelling took him three weeks to clear. <laughs> I felt a bit guilty about saying, oh, I'd like this stripped, <laughs> but it was worth it. Yeah. But as a young family back yes. in the late 70s, early 80s, yeah. did you, what did you do um, as a family together? Well, we, we used to walk. We we liked walking around the village. When you know, um, we go out in the car. Sometimes we exploring, uh, and um, we didn't have a great deal of, of free time. Quite frankly, not if you're open seven days. No, week. this is this is it. <laughs> and there are times when you think, oh, let's put the feet up. But it was nice. We sat. We were there with the children the whole time. And, and actually, they were marvellous at helping in the shop, too. Um, especially if my husband had gone to the quarry, I was sometimes incredibly glad to see them get off the school Land Rover. Oh, thank you. Can you help me? And, well, sometimes a bit reluctantly. Uh, yeah, all right. And they, they were super. Yeah. What, what did they do to help you out? Oh, th they, would, they would serve. Um, they would so get people, and we'd um, they would they would serve people very very well. They could they could serve petrol. They could do they could sell stamps. They you know I mean after all I was responsible for the money in the post office, uh, but they didn't make mistakes. I don't think they not about post office. They were they became quite adept at it. 
and local people knew them and would chat to them and uh, and, and that was that was so nice mm. Being somebody of, I think, of the same age as your children, mm. pocket money? Was there oh, such don't. a thing? Shh, 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 shh. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. No pocket money? Afraid not. No, oh. no, no. Um, well, now and again, yes. Um, but my, they knew if they asked, they could have what they wanted from the shop. Um, and no, uh, yeah, yeah, they were. One was slightly more restrained than the other. I would say. <laughs> I'm not saying who was which. Don't, don't please don't. No, no, no. Um, where did you go exploring? What did you start discovering in? Well, this we part love of the Havard. We absolutely uh, the Havard estate, just wonderful. Loved it. What we what were you discovering there? Well, it's it's the freedom for the children and the, and the the puppies we have. Um, to run and know it was safe but the, the beauty of the scenery and the well we felt safe completely safe and we, it was safe for them to to go exploring on their own um, we never had any worries about them um, you know they wouldn't go off on their own they would be together or with other children there were some other children about the same age in the village, which was lovely. Um, in particular, the Hubbard, a deep love for that. Uh, but the the streams, it's so different to a housing estate, you know, and the beauty and the smells and the sounds and the freshness. And then people, if you met them, friendly, chat. It was just sort of childhood mm. I think every child should have if possible did, did you did you walk from the post office here to have one no no I'm afraid the we we've, it was a bit too far because otherwise most of the time would have been taken up just doing the walk so we, we went by car yeah. or else up to the arch and then oh we go further afield we used to love both and then the slas and then we go up to Elam Valley, of course. And then when we had family visits and friends came. Oh, I tell you, what was really funny the first summer, um, say loads, we couldn't get over how many tourists were coming by, how busy the road was, and how many would stop at this tiny, tiny shop on this tiny mountain road. The people, they were, at least three lots of people who came in from our old stamping ground and we'd look at one another and we knew we knew one another and then I know who you are what are you doing here it was a wonderful thing and and I know one lady had come in she'd worked in the builders merchants where we used to live it was a a, a big village uh, and then it was getting very much very very quickly a whole lot bigger and um she, uh, she'd known my husband as a, a quite a small kid with his dad going into the builder's merchant, you see. And she looked at him, Reg, I wondered where you were, what are you doing here, you see. And then I came out the back and she'd said me, and I and you. And she didn't know that he and I were connected because I used to get sent to get jobs, stuff from the builder's merchants anyway, for jobs that we were doing at home then. And and then there was someone else because Reg used to repair bicycles, and I used to go to the local ironmongers who'd got a whole s array of bicycle repair stuff, and the man who I used to um, buy stuff off there, he was he came in the shop with his wife and family, and and we kept looking at one another thinking, I know you, where have I seen you before, and he, <laughs> his wife was looking between him and me. As if say, what the hell's going on here? And and it wasn't till after I was back visiting my mother in law where we used to live that I suddenly realised who he was. Oh, it was him in the shop bike shop. Oh, do you know l l there were several like that, mm -hmm. and it was great fun. What well, yeah. what kind of tourists were, were calling in on you? Oh my word! All for all every corner of the world, I'd say there was one gentleman I remember from Iceland, wonderful English really, and. Uh, 
always another coincidence, um, not the first year necessarily, but there were a, a, a family came in and she was, they were calling, there was a husband and wife and a boy and a girl. And do you know what, they got virtually the same names as us. Um, I can't remember what there was, I, I think she was Margaret, not Marjorie, and he was a Reg, and the children were very similar to Nigel and Hilary. I think they might have been. And they were from South Africa. And so I said, oh, I've got a cousin who lives out in Cape Province. Oh, yeah, we're from Cape Province. He says, he's Newlands. Oh, yeah, we live in Newlands. And I said, he runs the Kingsbury Nursing Home. Oh, the children were born there. Now, isn't that astounding? Mm. Out of all this way, and I wouldn't have sort of picked up, apart from all the names were the same virtually. That was really, sh really, really shook me, quite honestly. Do you remember what was the, was that, what was attracting people to this part of Wales to, to visit back then? What, what information were you gathering in terms of why oh. were they coming to this part of Wales? I think they told about the beauty and that it wasn't full of tourists. It wasn't, they wanted somewhere that was quiet, breathtaking, the word mountains sort of attracted them. They're the sort of people, like many, thank goodness, who actually yearn for beauty and peace. And, and I think the human soul needs it, mm. mostly, mm. mostly do. Or if they don't know what they're missing, if they haven't. And um, I, I think they come because they really appreciate it. And because so many say, I didn't know there was such a lovely place, area, as this. But I mean, every part of Wales is beautiful in its own way. But this is my favourite. Mm. It would be, wouldn't yeah. it? <laughs> Switching off from the, the shop, the post office and the petrol station, how did you get involved with community life, if you managed to get any time at all? What? Well, um, it was... It was part of being here. the The church was a big thing, and of course the chapel. And but not not being Welsh speaking, I didn't think of going there. And I'd always had an interest anyway. And um, whereas we we didn't we weren't church goers uh, where we were. Um, I had been as a child, and then I thought I'd I'd like to go back, and so it was. The vicar, we had a vicar in the village then, and he said, Oh, you know, who he be was? Yes, uh, John Oswald Davis, Reverend. He became a canon um, and moved back to. Oh. Oh, I've forgotten where he moved back to okay. South Wales more. Yeah. Near Carmarthen. Yeah. Uh, Manodalo. Yeah, all right. Is that it? Yes, yes. Um, well remembered. Yeah, thank <laughs> <Like> you. <laughs> Last moment. <laughs> um, and the. His wife was a huge uh, help in telling me about things and um, uh, useful information that, not gossip, but things that it would it helpful to know and keep in the background so as not to offend, because it's so easy to offend without having any idea. It's sort of just a throwaway remark could be significant to someone, and you hadn't got a clue. Uh, but so that was really good, and, and and so I was. It was so lovely to be able to go, and I took the children, and um, and my husband would keep the shop open, and and it was bilingual, of course. But the the books were provided, and you just looked on the other side of the page and you could follow it. It, it was no bother at all. Lovely. Mm. Um, it was it was part of living here. So and it still tell is. Tell me where the church was. It's Havod Church, Eglis Noeth. And um, it's it's still a very important part of my life. And uh, it's it's meant such a lot. Somewhere to go. It's where my husband rests now. His body rests, and um, in amongst the blue bars, which is lovely, uh, for everybody. And um, 
I shan't be mind being there myself one day amongst the blue wolves. So I thought that the first year we were here, coming up the church and the snow had all gone, and then the bluebells came. My word, what a sight, that wonderful sweep of blue. Ah, oh, lovely. So there I'll be amongst friends one day. <laughs> and Any other involvement with community, community life in the village here? Uh, um, there used to be, sadly, but it was very active then, Cymdeithas Cymwestrith, and that was organised by the man who we, from whom we bought the shop. And he was very much involved in community. And once a month, people would join together in where he moved to the old school. And we go to the old school hall, you know, it was great. And um, we, we'd have various topics or go on outings and um, visit somewhere. And then uh, uh, sadly, um, that, that dissipated after a while, but it was good while it lasted. Um, and then um, Cumdathus of um, uh, Cumostrith, a, a different. Uh, oh, can you stop for a minute? Yes, all right, yeah. Can you? Yeah. I, I, it could be a bit sensitive. I'd hate to offend. Covnardiona cum. Oh, no, that's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> wonderful. So you've got Covnardiona cum at the moment, haven't you? Yes, that's wonderful. Yes, very, very nice. I know I can go over Wednesday afternoon. It's a lovely, lovely... Tell me about Wednesday afternoon in the, in the oh, valley now then. Down in the chapel, yeah. um, Capel Siloam, uh, in the vestry, Wednesday afternoons, it's open house and people are welcome to go and chat. And uh, uh, Brisson, who you've met, uh, is, and his, his wife and other people who belong to the chapel, um, sit and they, they talk and make people so welcome with tea and cakes uh, and it's it's much appreciated um, social gathering I think it's wonderful yes are you still discovering things about Cumhurst with at the moment oh yes because of well my daughter's interested in the history and she's done some research about people who used to live in Penknuch, this little lane next to us. Mm. And, uh, but this links in with Kovnodion, uh, um, and, and so you hear snippets all the time, different people living in different places. And, and I find it fascinating. Mm. Um, unfortunately, we need to gather it now as much as we can, because so many of the real sources of information have left us. Yeah. Well, do you remember when you first arrived, who some of the characters were? Oh. People you had to, <laughs> people you wanted to see on, on, a, mm. on a regular occasion, maybe? Mm, all of them, to be honest. <laughs> Every you one of some them. Oh, uh, yes. Who they might have been and what Yes. Day? Oh, now, how long have we got? <laughs> Starting at the far end of the village towards Ryder, uh, there was a, a lady who'd been a farm servant and she, she'd she worked w with the royal family um, and uh, she, she'd she spent most of her life, I, I believe, working with them and looking after the children, but working on the farm and, and oh, she was just wonderful. Um, she was... Do you remember her name? In a minute. In a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gives my age away, doesn't that's it? Okay, that's okay. <laughs> oh, minute you tell me, just I'll, as I'll I was in, as well. just <laughs> as I was introducing the, I suddenly thought, oh heck, what's her name? <laughs> <laughs> but, but linked to the royal family, I think. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh yes, I've, I've got. I can hear her voice. I can see her, and hear her talking, and. She was just so sweet and uh, lovely, and she would come in um, with, uh, and then um, the there was um, Alfred who used to be working there. I only met him a couple of times, but it's lovely. I met him carol singing. Oh, the first carol singing was amazing. It's 
Yes, it was truly amazing. And in amongst all the snow and that, we went round and I was sitting in the back of a Land Rover with everybody, uh, not everybody, just a few of them. We had a couple of Land Rovers and a, and a VW camp van going round. <laughs> it was the merriest. In the snow? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, well I met um, this, this gentleman, Alfred. He poked his head out the door from where he was living. And he'd, he'd worked on the farms all his life. And my husband had had a good old chat with him. And he'd, it was long before, fortunately, the drink and drive days, because by the time my husband left the cottage, the house, he really shouldn't have been driving. He wouldn't have done it now. But um, in those days, people weren't bothered, really. And this gentleman had been so sociable. How would you have a drive of whiskey? So, we learned a lot about farming and the, the social thing from then. Um, uh, and then um, there was Tom and Blood. Oh my goodness. They, they, they were wonderful. Everybody respected and liked them. He, Tom had a small holding, uh, well, small farm really, 70 odd acres, I think. And he worked as a, a road man and he the, the roads along here were kept wonderfully you didn't get potholes ditches were cleaned all this and that as they were everywhere weren't they a lot more um, and Blod was a wonderful warm human being they both were um, and she would come in the shop lean on the counter and talk and talk to me and pull my leg. She'd pull everybody's leg who came in. And uh, who are you then, you see, and it's just strangers. She found out she should have worked for MI5. She was wonderful in the loveliest direct way and friendly. And you just couldn't help but answer and they couldn't either. And, um, and she was so warm hearted and she loved children and everybody. She loved everybody, and we all respect her. Do you know, one day in church, as she was, I'm sorry, I dodge around all the place. One little thing tells me another thing. Um, she was she was reading a lesson. Now, this lesson was one of her favorites. And as part of her upbringing, Sunday school and school, they had to learn quite long sections of the Bible. And she just stood there, packed church. Her head went back, her eyes closed, and she recited it. And then there wasn't another sound. This wonderful Welsh performance. It was, it was glorious. Mm. And such feeling. Oh my word. Mm. Oh. And then, you know, I had to go up and read the next one and I felt oh dear me and I said what a hard act to follow but I just did what I could but um, nothing very very poor comparison to her and I honour her for it mm. we all did mm. in terms of the school then the children went to a school mm. did, did you manage to get involved with school life at all no, I'm afraid I didn't. I was too busy with the shop. We would support financially, you know, if um, they were doing anything, and we still still do a bit. I do, um, and I I was just so grateful for them, as I've said. Uh, is there much else? Well, life was pretty full, you know. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. children you mentioned went to a school to get on. Mm. Then where did they go? Oh, well, um, further ed in Aberystwyth, and then um, my, my son was very keen on computers. F from the days when you had a little Sinclair thing, I think it was, you press a button, uh, one little lever, that, like a little joystick, and I remember him staying, standing behind the counter, sort of ever so thrilled with it, saying, when I grow up, I'm going to work with computers, and I thought, what, from this? You know? And I sort of patted him on the head, thinking, 
they're there, my dear. Don't worry, they're there. You'll always have a shop to run. <laughs> how wrong, how mistaken was I? Where did and he actually, go? he went to, he, he carried on to, to gar with further ed, and then uh, in co with computing, and then he went down to Portsmouth. Um, it was a poly technical school, college then, and then it became a university. And he he, he graduated in in there, and he, he he married and stayed there. He lives down there, and he comes back when he can because he loves it. He always yearns to get back on the Harvard and goes down the road to leans on the Bailey Bridge and looks at the waterfalls and it, once it's under your skin, it's in your DNA really. It gets there. And Hilary? Oh, she lives in Clanon. <gasps> Ah yes 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 she's married a Welshman and um, uh, she she is did sort of admin she loves admin and so she went to further ed in um, well first of all it was in Newtown then the the in printing and then she um, she moved over to um, Pibber Lloyd is it Pibber Lloyd in in Carmarthen and did public administration. Mm. Mm, that's what she does. Oh, well, well. And as children, did they participate in any local activities or traditions? Uh, hmm. Do you know, they, they, my son went to Scouts over in Astrid Myring, um, and he loved that. And then he, but then, say he, he went. It would no. It was Cub Scouts he went to, and he did enjoy that. But there wasn't much else. I must admit, um, we'd have helped them where we could. But my daughter wasn't interested in that sort of thing. Uh, but she yearned to have a pony. And some people who lived along the mountain road started a little trekking centre. They thought. So she was in her element there. She would go along and help muck out, and and that was wonderful. And then, eventually, one of the local farmers said we could use a, well, a field um, for put a pony in for her, and that was her life and love. And she, it, it, it was what made such a lot of difference to her. She wasn't lonely then, because other people had moved away. So she didn't really have anyone in the village to be a friend. But, did, uh, did you discover any st stories or legends about this part of Wales when you first arrived and, and thought, well, hmm, I don't believe that, and then later realising actually th these these stories were true? Or n not not legends, but the a, f a farmer who. Um, Who's, who's, his family still farm here, of course, was marvellous about telling us local history and anecdotes of people who, who, who lived around. Some I'd better not repeat, really, <laughs> but said with love and affection, but I think better not to repeat. But there was some really sad tales of I illustrating the struggles that people had to survive and one in particular how a, a widow and a, a son had um, they had got no wood to even well, very little to eat either but the son went into a, a mine shaft um, and and took some wood but sadly he, he wasn't he wasn't very wise in the wood he chose, and the, and the the it was a prop, and actually the, there was a a fall and it killed him. And there'd been anger in the village that he was thieving. Well, no compassion then. It would, from some. Obviously, a lot of people would have had compassion as he this gentleman did. Um, for the poor woman who was absolutely without support then or or a son left absolutely destitute mm. but th there was such hardship wasn't there mm. and and people 
who a family who'd lived right at the top of the village, who uh, the family were ill, and so a child was dispatched to a doctor in Pontry de Grois. But by the time they all got back, they died. Uh, you know, it's severe poverty and and struggle. Things like that, it, it really makes you appreciate what we've got mm. and how brave and strong the people were to continue. Mm. What we take for granted would have been such luxury to them. You know, I do admire and honour them, what I hear. Honestly, I do. You mentioned the Harbour Estate and the, and the church and the waterfalls mm. and the walks being one end of the valley. Of course... Uh, the other end of the valley, we have the old lead mines. Yes, we do. What, you know, you, you must you must have had a a strange experience of probably seeing that valley for the first time. What were your Oh, we did. What were your thoughts of well, seeing the old industrial heritage of Cumaswith? We were in awe. Um, there was a huge milling shed up there. A, a monster was a sketch of it there. Um, uh, this vast structure covered with rusty corrugated sheets that rattled in the wind and a piece of uh, the machinery still suspended um, that was it, it was spooky actually because there's always a wind coming along that valley and you thought my word however did people manage to work here and in in all weathers and mostly it was cold, because it doesn't get hot along there very often. Um, and how drafty. And how did they survive? Um, uh, the, the, the houses along there were more visible then, 40 odd years ago. Uh, a, a lot have been, um, well, they, they've just collapsed, you know, and or been removed for safety. But it was, we were, really intrigued by it, what was going on here. We didn't realise it was about the biggest lead mine in Europe. But one thing, we because we, we used to like gathering, sort of not exactly antiques, but interesting old bits and pieces. And I'd got a, an old atlas, I think it was 1848 or 1845, anyway, whenever the Congress of Vienna was. And um, it was about like a A4 size now and thick leather bound thing and so the page for United Kingdom was say what, about 8 10 inches long and so the whole of the United Kingdom was on that and you know Comustwith was written on it that was a staggering wasn't it and so it just showed the importance of it then did you ever go up there and investigate further? Oh, you bet. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, of a, um, a, a quiet day, uh, we'd, we'd, well, in the summer we could shut at six and then go for a family walk up there, actually get in the car to save, save energy and the time. And we would, we would scramble round. And, and actually, we, we found that there was a club we used to go in, uh, um, um, because it was barricaded for safety, but um, there was a, a mining club, who, who, a caving club, who, not caving, but actual mining, who, who, who went in, and we were able to accompany them. Uh, and gosh, that was an that was an experience. Well, well is now that they'd, they'd you, you crawled through an upturned truck uh, that was put there as a barricade, you crawled through that. And then had to wade through a bit. Well, it was all right for most people, but being short, I was not quite up to my middle, but it wasn't very comfortable. <laughs> and then sort of got the other side and drained the wellies out and off you went. But it was fascinating. We had miners' helmets on with batteries on and not to touch the white streaks because they were like arsenic, I think. Uh, but a wonderful guide and going through it was terrific and there was where a, a trickle of water came through at a steady rate 
there was a plastic bottle, would you believe, that filled up and then it tipped. And then the weight of that rang a bell. And it hadn't been plastic in the original time, but somebody replaced it with that. That was a means of counting time, recording time or something. Mm. And it's probably still going, I don't know. And it, there was a huge cavern there that I swear you could have put the church in, huge. Um, where they milled and um, mined and gradually worked down. And then there was a bit that was, they say Roman times, a small arc tunnel you go along. And then across a narrow, a very narrow strip was a bit worrying. And um, that has now got um, just a, a, a rack, a rail, because a lot of it had little trucks, rails for hand pushing it must have been such hard work but do you know when we came out the overwhelming thing was how warm it was outside and the you could smell everything there was no smell in there and when you came out you could smell the grass the fresh air you could smell the plants it was astounding yeah you, you would go there as a family um, just no, yourself. just my husband and me, and this mount, this this group. Uh, no, you must. Nobody should go on on their own because there are mine shafts. Uh, it be the tunnels are so complex, you could easily get lost very easily. But it was a marvelous experience. Yeah. But in your time here in Cumberland, you've seen various kinds of tourists. Mm. Have you seen the type of tourist change over the years? Uh, there's a lot more, shall we say motorcycles, um, that get a lot of those and a lot of clubs more, motor clubs come through, mm. but they don't stop, do they? They just love the mountain road, which is so stunning. And um, you can understand their joy and enthusiasm for coming along here. Mm. You get a lot of walkers still, comparatively and cyclists a cyclist now I do admire them you didn't get it in the old days the cyclists no but the, it's a thing more now um, if if you're out there in the garden or just out the front and talk to people walking no they're the same people who love it and there's the Cambrian way which comes through um, it's not very well used but um, those who do are the people who absolutely love this kind of area and they like walking. They don't mind the solitude. I admire those too. Because it can be pretty wet and cold, can't it? Yeah. In a, of course, in a remote, um, unforgiving part of Wales, as mm -hmm. uh, parts of the Cambrian Mountains are, mm -hmm. any wildlife, nature? Oh, you mentioned bluebells earlier, of course. Oh, bluebells! So what yes. What else is here in terms of nature and wildlife? Well, the, I, my main interest is in the the birds. The red kites, when we first came, were extraordinarily rare. This is where they were, and the few remaining were in this zone. And we, we used to give teas and coffees to the kite wardens, the volunteers who came to guard the nests. They were heroic, and it was usually very, very cold, bless them. Um, and they'd stay in not luxurious circum uh, surroundings on the Harvard Estate, but they did it for the love of the birds. Um, so there's the red kites and there's buzzards, they would chuff. Peregrines up in the mine, um, they've not been there for a while, but they were. Um, and there were, um, oh, Pine Martins, they're back, been reintroduced. Polecats have been here. Uh, there's been sightings of a big black cat in times. And actually, after the, the real bad snow, I, I went out the, and looked around the back and I saw these huge footprints. I'm talking four inches across. and. And I called my husband and, good grief, measured. 
and they were six feet from one stretch to the other. You know, four paw of the right and the rear of the left were six feet. And we thought, gosh, this is huge. And called the local farm or something. They, they, they happened to be two or three there meeting at the local farm and they came over and took photographs. And it was, it, there were footprints all around my house, all the way and up the lane. So something had come looking for a handy snack. Uh, that was a bit disconcerting. And we used to have a caravan at the end where somebody stayed, lived. Um, and he said, because he'd got a, li a little cat, he said, this cat was petrified. And, and it, was, it was just shivering. And he knew what on earth. And then he saw a big black paw come down from the roof as if it was trying to get at this cat. And, and so he shouted and um, retracted. And he heard something jump. And he hadn't realised anything was on the roof of the caravan, but then he jumped off and he looked through the window and this black cat disappeared. Ooh. So that's no that's no legend, you know, it's real. <laughs> um, oh, now then, what else? Oh, we're getting deer. Yes, there've been. There's quite a lot of deer and foxes, of course. Um, they're not good news for farmers, and I can understand that. I'm on the side of the farmer, really, when it comes to lots of lambs being, you know, wasted. And that, that is serious, as well as the misery. And badgers, people don't realise they take lambs too, kill them. But there are badgers around, and my particular favourites are hedgehogs. But I don't see many now. Mm. But I do feed, put food out for them. That, uh, cuckoo? Yes, now that's been heard already this year. Yes, love the cuckoo. Broad was always first to hear the cuckoo. Um, now what else? There's bound to be other things. <laughs> what about um, red squirrels? Oh, not... Well, there are rumours, but I don't think we've got any in on the Havard. As far as I know, I'd be so thrilled if there were. We all would, I think. Tell me, where's your favourite part of the Havard estate? It, for example, now, <laughs> I can see it there. If you were to take somebody who was visiting the area to the Havel Estate, where yes, would you take them? Yes, I would take them to what's called Pushpyrium. It's a, a lovely walk. You go down a zigzag path and you end up by the river where a stream comes down in a, sort of a zigzag of waterfalls. And where the water hits the pool at the bottom, you get such wonderful oxygen and it's quiet it's in amongst the, the there's a variety of trees there mainly pine at the moment but there are some deciduous ones too but that is a most wonderful spot and you can stand on a rock you can stand onto a big flat rock in the middle of this river and water swirling round you and you've got the wonderful fresh water you've got the song of the birds and Feel the fresh breeze on your face, and very little else. It's marvellous. Mm. Marvellous. Lots of places like that on the Harvard, actually. That's my yeah, special place. You've been very kind for the, to the Harvard fair play, and I'm sure, no, I'm no, sure no. they'll appreciate that mm. vivid description you, you gave us. Uh, you've been here forty-five years. Mm. What's what's been the biggest change, or some of the biggest changes? <laughs> Well, I think it's people coming in who don't necessarily mix so much. It's their choice, of course, but they don't know what they're missing. They would have such an enhanced experience here. Um, there's, it's amazing what wonderful people you get to know here. And it's been remarkable how, from this tiny village, eminent people have arisen. You know, you hear lots of tales of 
remarkable achievements from this tiny village. I, I think it's wonderful. I know a lot of places would say exactly the same, but well, it astounds me from the proportion. Um, I'm. It's a shame that the shop has shut, because that was such a a hub, and that was lovely. When we we do have events at the chapel because it's lovely that the Stethwood goes again now um, and the uh, the other the village hall which is the church hall but it doesn't matter it's all is for Gomostri. Um people are very good at coming from surrounding villages mainly the Welsh people I would say mainly um, and and supporting it the event which is precious and likewise Kermustwis folk go to support them. Um, I, the essence and the support in for the local people for one another I think is tremendous and very very special. I value it tremendously. If you were to be walking down the street in Aberystwyth and somebody asked you where you were from, where would you say you were from? Oh, Camustwyth. And if you were walking down the street in London and you were asked where were you from, where would you say you were from? Camustwyth. And similarly, if you were privileged to go to New York... <laughs> it would still be from Wales. Still from Wales. Still mm. from Wales. Mm. Mm. Um, is there anything else you might like to add to the recording that might be of interest to, to the listener? I just feel it's been such a privilege living here. Uh, I still feel that same joy looking at the view and meeting the same people. There's a sadness so many that I've known and, and loved in a way, you know, in the widest, nicest sense, yeah. and respected are now no longer with us. Um, but the, the legacy has meant I've been privileged to have a wonderful, rich life. I value that so much. And they've enabled me to say that. I, I, it's been wonderful meeting people here. And I found, a, on the whole, you can't if I have to say the same about everybody, you can't get to know everybody. But the ones I have met, have, have, it's been very, very special. I would not have had that, been able to say that, had I lived in, stayed where I was. Um, that's no disrespect. Some people couldn't live out here, they'd find it too quiet, too isolated. But I will say, since I sadly lost my husband, I, um, who I miss dreadfully still, but I can, I can contact anyone, several people, yeah. if I wanted just to ring up and have a chat, yeah. and and similarly they can with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't complain about anything, can yeah. I? And I and yes, um, very sorry to the to hear that your husband has passed away, and mm. you, I know you miss him dearly, mm. but quietly. And calmly we've had a little dog in, in this room for the last <laughs> hour and a half sitting there quietly so mm. obedient and uh, well yes we've, we've trusted ben, Benji yes Benji yes we've trusted him very very well and he's really sat there and a lovable uh, mm. character and I'm sure a lovable yes. companion he is. to you as well he is yes um, Marjorie Bud yes thank you for your time it's been a privilege and a pleasure to spend uh, no. uh, this morning with you um, I've laughed quietly I've, I've, I've chuckled inside uh, what you've managed to tell us about your life here in Comerswith in the Camry Mountains is just a joy to, to have been able to record <laughs> oh. uh, and also to have listened to so, so thank you for your time today oh, I my... look forward to listening back on this uh, in the next few weeks Do you know it's been my pleasure reminiscing you've made it so easy thank you i'm so aware that i've got like butterfly brain really a bit here a bit there all oh, spark off and that reminds me of that but you've you've just allowed me to be myself and it's been <laughs> i haven't had to behave have i <laughs>
Thank you for your time, Angelique. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Jockey's here.